Welcome to this overview of children's literature resources at the Beinecke Library at Yale University. My name is Timothy Young, and I serve as curator for Modern Books and Manuscripts, with a focus on many areas, including children's literature. Yale has always had materials about childhood and for young readers as part of its collections, going back to the founding years of the college. Let's take a look at some examples of books that have been at Yale for several centuries. There are a number of examples of early primers and other educational books. In fact, many were printed in New Haven by colonial era printers. One of the most successful was the Babcock family, which included John and his sons under many different company names, including Sydney's Press, as seen on this book about birds. This title from 1831 was full of cautionary tales to warn children of the dangers of living in a quickly modernizing world, from hot stoves to angry dogs to galloping carriages. In a wider sense, there have been many titles acquired by the Yale Library that appealed to younger readers and even teenagers, keeping in mind that well into the 19th century, students as young as 14 years old could be enrolled at Yale. So joke books and satirical magazines joined more serious tomes on the library shelves. One of the earliest gifts to Yale of books for juvenile readers from a Yale alumnus came in the 1960s and 1970s from C. Beecher Hogan, a lecturer in English at Yale who was a pioneer collector of L. Frank Baum. However, the modern growth for juvenile materials at Yale coincided mainly with the establishment of the Beinecke Library and our connection with the Beinecke family. The first major research archive related to childhood and children's literature to be placed at Yale was the J.M. Berry Papers. This was a gift from Walter Beinecke Jr., a son of one of the three brothers who funded the construction and operation of the library. He said that he started buying Berry materials for two reasons. He was a dedicated smoker and purchased a first edition of Barry's My Lady Nicotine. And then he moved on to Peter Pan materials because he had young daughters who loved the 1950s Walt Disney adaptation. But because he came from a family of collectors, he continued to widen his scope as one must do with Barry. We must keep in mind that the Peter Pan story and its variants were the sole juvenile works created by J.M. Barry for children. The vast majority of Barry's other works, and there were hundreds of them, novels, plays, stories, even musical scenarios, were for adult audiences. He was arguably the most successful playwright in England at the turn of the 20th century, but Peter Pan remains the most enduring of his works. Here is a wonderful large-scale costume sketch by William Nicholson for the original production of Peter Pan, and some views of the three-act version of the play used in the 1904-1905 production. It includes manuscript revisions in an unidentified hand, and is interleaved with lighting plots, stage sketches, and prompt cues. Of special note is a preface titled, A Note on the Acting of a Fairy Play. Here is a map of Kensington Gardens by Arthur Rackham, and an autographed manuscript signed of the five-act version of Peter Pan prepared for publication with a dedication to the five, dated May 9th, 1928, and the rarest item of all, the only surviving copy of The Boy Castaways of Black Lake Island, published by Barry in 1901, the genesis of the Peter Pan story. The next juvenile literary archive that came to Meineke was more local and also more fragmentary. The surviving papers of the William R. Scott Publishing Company, which was based on a progressive educational model as taught at the Bank Street School in New York in the 1930s one that ran contrary to what library practice held as a standard of service for young children. But thank goodness, because it brought us such brilliant authors as Margaret Wise Brown, Clement Hurd, and many others, such as Gertrude Stein, whose The World is Round was published by Scott in 1939. The William R. Scott Catalog of Children's Books, 1938 or 39, included an important preface about the aims of the company. Here is an archival piece, Jean Charlot's mock-up page for Margaret Wise Brown's Two Little Trains from 1949. 
the Peter Newell papers added more strengths in regards to the work of this leading early 20th century humorist. Here are various items from the Peter Newell collection on display. The moment at which Beinecke Library and Yale became a locus for research into children's literature and childhood in American history was the gift of Betsy Beinecke Shirley in 1987. Mrs. Shirley, the daughter of Walter Beinecke Sr. and sister of Walter Jr., who had donated the J.M. Barry material, began the process of donating her collection of books, manuscripts, artwork, and other objects related to the juvenile experience. Mrs. Shirley was a very smart collector who worked with book dealers to find great copies of books she loved as a young reader, as well as books her grandchildren were reading, but with an eye to gathering materials that were suitable for research, pieces that told of the educational, reading, and cultural lives of American children. Here are some interesting examples from her collection, such as the book Philadelphia Vocabulary from 1787, with a flyleaf showing ownership marks for the book. Juvenile Amusements, printed by G.J. Loomis and Company in 1822, which taught the basics of the alphabet, as well as images of wholesome pastimes, such as blowing bubbles and spinning yarn. However, amusements were limited for children in early America. Most of their time required attention to their heavenly souls, as pointed out in titles such as Honey Out of the Rock Flowing to Little Children That They May Know to Refuse the Evil and Choose the Good by the prolific Isaac Watts, printed in 1715 in Boston. As years went by, more fun was allowed, like hand shadows to be thrown upon the wall from around 1861 and pop-up and movable books, such as Dean's Living Peter by Lothar Megendorfer. Betsy Shirley was drawn to interesting formats for children, such as printing on cloth, as in this example of a kerchief with the story of Cock Robin, as well as books for the blind, such as this item printed in New York in 1911. Her collection includes some novelties, this read out loud books series that's stored in a dog shaped paper mache bookcase and popular cultural materials, including comic books that explain science and the civil rights movements. In my role as curator, I add to the strengths of the collection in many ways, seeking out how American books and characters made inroads with audiences outside this US as in this Italian version of The Adventures of a Well-Known Mouse, which happens to have been translated by the award-winning writer Cesare Pavese early in his career in the 1930s. The Shirley Collection also has a strength in manuscript items. Here is Jellett Burgess's manuscript of The Most Peculiar History of the Chewing Gum Man from 1894, a letter by Louise May Alcott from the 1880s, and a manuscript book, the History of Birds in Verse and Prose, from 1794, by the otherwise unknown William Colwell. Oh, and one of my favorite pieces, this work by Eugene Field, the humorist, Extinct Monsters, from 1895. Building and promoting these collections is a delight, but they don't mean as much without the research potential they provide for Yale students, faculty, and researchers who come to visit us from around the world even if those visits have been virtual for much of the past year. Here are some examples of visiting and graduate fellows who have worked at Beinecke, many supported by the Shirley Fund. Making click on discourses of humanness in children's literature, Brian Alderson on 19th century illustration, Robin Bernstein on racial innocence, Heather Clemen and Marie Tatar. Here's the cover of the book by Robin Bernstein, who now serves as Dillon Professor of American History at Harvard. A project with lasting impact is Heather Clemens' work, which was influenced by a visit to a class session at Beinecke Library when she was a graduate student, where she saw this book that became part of her PhD thesis, The Mother's Remarks on a Set of Cuts for Children, from Philadelphia, 1803. About 10 years ago, Beinecke began partnering with a PhD program in children's literature at Trinity College Dublin to support an annual bursary for research in children's literature. Here are names and projects for just a few students from the first decade, 
Siobhan Callahan, working on representation of displaced children in the Second World War literature, Rebecca Long on physical and metaphysical landscapes in books, and Brian McManus on Darby O'Gill and the construction of Irish identity. As curator of the Shirley Collection since 2002, I've had the pleasure of being able to add to the strengths of her papers by bringing in new and increasingly more diverse books and archives. These include the papers of, among many, Edgar Perrin and Ingrí Dolaire, the multi-talented Mo Willems, and the work of Russell and Lillian Hoban, whose books, I hope, have a continually refreshed audience. And it is my pleasure to tell you about our most recent edition, which will be announced soon, the papers of multiple award-winning author Jacqueline Woodson. If you're interested in reading more about Beinecke's collections of children's literature, including some interesting critical takes, I edited a pair of volumes based on Beinecke's holdings, Drawn to Enchant and Storytime, both available from Yale University Press. Thanks for joining us and happy reading.